Uh, today we're going to jump into a revival called the Desert Fathers or the Desert Monks. And uh, you can guess they did live in the desert. Um, history will tell us that in the fourth century, when the Roman Emperor Constantine embraced Christianity, it brought about a cultural shift. And so what happened was, uh, after Jesus, Christians were still being persecuted, and, and then the, uh, uh, the Emperor Constantine embraced Christianity, and then people started embracing Christianity. So, so Christians went from being persecuted to now they were being embraced. But the issue was this. It resulted in the cutting edge of ch the church's life being blunted, and so the church wasn't as effective which resulted in mediocrity, accommodation, and compromise as social standing became the reason for faith, not Jesus. And so people were all about saying they were Christians because they thought it made themselves look better. But they weren't too concerned with Jesus. And so we jump into this uh, revival. Now, the Desert Fathers was pioneered by a guy named St. Anthony, who wasn't the first desert monk, but he was fairly important. And we'll learn, if you would research it, um, I would recommend like Wikipedia, because it's pretty accurate. Uh, online, you can search it there, or just Google it, or YouTube, or I don't know what else, what other platforms there are. But research the Desert Fathers, um, and you'll learn that St. Anthony was born to wealthy parents. Uh, then he heard the gospel preached when he was about 16. And he read that verse where it says, hey, go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. And he said, oh, that's what I need to do. And so he did it. And then we learned that St. Anthony actually moved out to the deserts. And the desert fathers lived in the deserts of uh, Syria, um, Egypt, and Palestine. And that's kind of where they lived uh, in that time. One part uh, that I do want to share before we jump into the scripture to kind of parallel these things is uh, through research of St. Anthony, it says that in 285, he went alone into the desert to leave, live in complete solitude. Complete solitude. That means no one's there. That sounds lonely. Uh, I learned about their diet. Uh, they actually were like vegan. And so if you're vegan and you're in here, good job. Um, I like steak. <laughs> and so I think... God honors steak and people who eat it. Um, they were vegan because they didn't have livestock. They needed things that were quick to eat, uh, quick to make, uh, easy to maintain. And so I'm not making that up. They were literally vegan. Um, you should research it. It's very interesting. Uh, St. Anthony died at the age of 105 after leading uh, multiple groups into the desert to live in complete solitude with him. And so today what I want to talk about is the value and the necessity of finding moments in your life that are set aside specifically for God. Like maybe you want to call them God moments or like holy moments, but just time where it's just you and him. It's not all these other distractions. It's literally just you and God. And there's a story in the Bible that I think will help illustrate it for us. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 10. We're going to read verses 38 to 42. Luke is in the New Testament of the Bible. The New Testament talks about the coming of Jesus and the fulfilling, fulfillment of that prophecy. And so we're jumping in, Luke 10, verses 38 to 42, and this is what it says. Now as they went on their way, they, meaning Jesus and the disciples, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. It's what it sounds like when we tell our kids to go clean and one of them's not. He's like, Dad, you said to clean. Can you tell Hendrix to help me clean? But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. You can write this in your message notes today. Revival comes when we create space for God. Revival comes when we create space for God. Let's pray this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, uh, we just ask that you would speak today, that you would speak clearly, uh, with authority, 
that we would be able to see you more clearly after the message today, that we would be able to hear you, and God, that we would even be able to feel you. And God, as a church, we thank you that the Niners are undefeated and you've led your team to victory. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, say amen. Amen. Four weeks and they're undefeated because this is a bye week. They're not even playing today. But I will take it. What is your greatest distraction? Like your greatest distraction. So maybe you've never been in a worship experience where I'm speaking. I love when people actually respond. Like you can actually say stuff. YouTube. YouTube is his greatest distraction. Oh my gosh, there's like 10 answers at once. Netflix, computer, phone, phone, TV, children. <laughs> oh, I hope they're not in here. What else? One more. Work. I'm sending this to your boss. Work is his greatest distraction. I went to Instagram this past week to ask, what is your greatest distraction? And here's what people said, some of whom are sitting next to you in those seats. Instagram, for sure. Netflix. I don't even know what TikTok means. My bed. <laughs> That's terrible. Social media, the gram. The gram is a distraction. I love this one. This is super honest. Thinking of the things I could be doing but not doing them. That's not us. <laughs> she was talking about somebody else. Uh, social media, online shopping, myself. Wow. And for some reason, there's a lot of people who think work is a distraction. <laughs> That's terrible. But I would beg to say that aside from all of these responses, there are more things that distract us in life. Like there are more distractions or, or voices that aren't represented here on the screen. And oftentimes it's these voices or distractions that become louder than the voice of God. Like we're so concerned by what everyone else is saying and what everyone, everyone else is saying that we don't even have room to hear from God. Like we're so influenced by what these voices are saying that our first thought isn't God, what do you think about this? It's, I wonder if anyone posted about this on Facebook. Huh. I wonder if they tagged me on Instagram about that. Like, we're so concerned with other voices that when something tragic happens, our question isn't, God, what do you think about this? It's, hmm, I wonder if the church posted anything about this. What does the church think about this? Or like, what do our friends think about this? Or even, what do other Christians think about this? But for some reason, we never ask, what does God think about this? I think that's why the Bible will tell us that Jesus, in his ministry, went away to be with God. Like, secluded himself from everyone to hear from God. The Bible actually cites 24 times, 24 that Jesus went away from the disciples to be with God so that he can hear from him. In Luke 5, 16, the Bible says that Jesus frequently withdrew. The Hebrew word for frequently is really hard to say, but it's on the screen. Phonetically, you would say hypochorio, but of course, that's not how you actually pronounce it. It's, let me try this, hypochorio, hypochorio, and what that means is a lot. Like, Jesus went away to be with God a lot. And I think if it's such a, big, a, such a big thing for Jesus to do, that we might want to consider it in our lives. Like, if Jesus could do it, I'm pretty sure we should do it. And this was the key ingredient that the Desert Fathers got right. They secluded themselves from everyone else so that they could just spend time with God, to hear from God. But at the same time, I think Martha didn't quite get this principle. You can write this in your message notes today. Martha was distracted by the voice of culture. She was distracted by all the things she had to do. Like Martha thought if she wasn't busy, she wasn't successful. Like if I'm not doing stuff more than the next person, then I'm not productive. 
Like Martha was thinking, what, would, what do people think, which is the worst way you can start any thought. What do people think if I just sit with Jesus? Like, don't I have to do stuff for him? Like, what do people think if I just sit next to Mary at the feet of Jesus? Like, I've got to be doing something. We live in an age today where our credibility is based on our calendar. Like, if we don't have enough stuff going on, we're not important. Our schedules, man, I've got to do more. Yeah, yeah, we don't have time to get to that, that dinner, but let's put it on our calendar. <laughs> like, if we do that event too, it'll stretch us thin. Yeah, yeah, we should do that. Like, have you ever met someone who just has a million things on their calendar? Like, well, today... I've got to get the kids ready for school. Then I got to go bring them to school. And then I have a mommy meet up um, at Starbucks with 12 other moms. And then I'm going to go to the library to bring uh, my baby to a uh, little baby class they have there. Um, after that, I have lunch with Diane. Um, and then after lunch with Diane, I got to go pick up our oldest because he gets out of school. After he gets out of school, I have to go bring him to a play date with his classmate. Uh, they want to have an ice cream date. And then after we do ice cream date, we have to drive across town to bring him to soccer practice. And oh yeah, Johnny has football practice over there too. Hmm, I must be important <laughs> because my calendar is full. It's so interesting how Maybe you've come across this, how when you ask someone how they're doing, hey man, how are you? Oh my gosh, I'm so tired. As if it makes them more important. Like if I'm not tired and I'm not so busy, that's not us. No, not at all. Like we live in a culture today where people say, picks, or it didn't happen. Like, I have to prove to you through my picture on Facebook and Instagram that I live a busy life, that I'm worth something, that I'm important because I go places and I do stuff. See, Martha believed this lie. Martha believed that if she didn't check enough items off of the list that Jesus would never love her. Martha believed that God was pleased by her ability to be busy. Well, if I just keep doing stuff, God's got to honor that. If I just keep moving, if I just keep trying to fix this and try to take care of this, if I just add more things to my schedule and my calendar, then they will know that I am important because my schedule says so. No, it's not us. Not at all. See, what Martha failed to realize, and you can write this today, is that who is more important than do? Like, Jesus, Jesus doesn't care about what you do. Jesus doesn't care about what you've done. Jesus cares about you. Aside from action, Jesus cares about you. Just because you're you. Like, I love my kids. I really love them if they clean up, but I love them anyway, just because they're my kids. Maybe you've come in here today and you're, you're not too sure where you stand with Jesus. Can I just help you out? He loves you. And maybe you're waiting for like an asterisk attached to that statement or an explanation of it. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is that that's it. Jesus just loves you. Like Jesus is always for you, and he's always been for you. It doesn't matter what you did or what you've done or what you're going to do. Jesus just loves you. It's like the great prophet Bruno Mars said. When Jesus sees your face, there's not a thing that he would change. Because you're amazing just the way you are. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're amazing just the way you are. Don't look that verse up, please, because it's not in there.
Matthew 3, 17, the Bible says that Jesus was being baptized and that the clouds parted from heaven and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. God looked at his son before he had healed anyone, before he had fed the 5,000 and said, man, I love my son just because he's my son. And I would tell you today that God is looking at you right now and he's saying, that's my son and I love him. That's my daughter, and I love her, and there's not a thing that can change it. The second thing is that Martha was deceived by the voice of the devil. Can we just, like, we're in church, like, there's a God, and there's a devil. Like, it's not scary. Like, it just is. Like, there's a heaven, and there's a hell. And so in this story, I found it so interesting because Martha invites Jesus into her home. Like, this is Martha's house, and she invites Jesus to come into her house. But it's almost as if Martha is trying to convince Jesus that he needs to come into the house. But he's already in the house. Revelation 3, God says, whoever, or I stand at the door and knock. If your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. And so Martha has invited Jesus into her house. And it's not just Jesus. Like, she's seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Like, Martha has invited the one thing that she's been searching for into her house, the one person who can make everything change. And now he's in the house, and Martha's still trying to convince him that he needs to be in the house, but he's already in the house. So why are you trying to convince him that he needs to be in the house? Jesus is already in the house. It's like... When you pray this prayer, we call it the sinner's prayer or the salvation prayer. God, forgive me of my sin. I repent. I turn to you. I receive you as Lord and Savior. Help me to live a life after you. Like we invite him into the house, into our heart. But then why do we try to convince him that he needs to come into our house when he's already in the house? The word devil or the name devil means Satan. And the literal, literal definition means accuser. I think this is what Martha was battling. It was that the voice of the devil was so loud in her thoughts or in her ear that she didn't realize what she had wanted all along was sitting right in front of her. Like Jesus, the savior of the world, who healed, who restored who raised from the dead, was sitting at her table, and she was busy trying to impress him with the things she was doing. Satan means accuser. And so this is what I think happened with Martha. I think she was deceived by the devil who accused her of not being good enough. Like, you prayed that prayer, but that didn't actually work, Martha. Martha. You actually have to do more stuff for Jesus. And then Martha's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Let me clean this up. Let me get this ready. Let me get this ready. And the devil was in her ear. Man, you're not good enough, Martha. You're not good enough for Jesus' love. And so Martha was like, yeah, I got I to gotta clean this up. All right, I got to wipe this mess. And the devil would say to her, Martha, you're a fake. You're a fraud. Like, you might impress these people on Sunday morning, but I know what you did last week. And so Martha was so deceived that she thought she had to do stuff to impress Jesus when he was already in the house. That's why I think it's so important in our lives that we hear the voice of God. Because in that moment, Martha should have been reciting back to the devil what God said about her. Like in that moment of feeling like, wow, maybe I'm not good enough, Martha should have went back to John 3.16 and said, well, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Like, I am good enough. What Martha should have said in that time where the devil was deceiving her in her thoughts is, hold on. I was created by Christ. I'm his workmanship. I'm called to do things according to, not according to my thoughts, 
But according to what this Bible says, hold on. I am good enough because Matthew 3.17 says that God looked at Jesus and said, this is my child with whom I'm well pleased. God's well pleased with me. Hold on, wait, wait. I don't have to do anything else. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And, and, and if it's finished, then why am I trying to impress Jesus again? Jesus is already in the house. We do this thing here at Experience Church called First and Ten. And I would encourage you, this is like another tool to go in your tool belt. First and Ten means the first ten minutes of the day. It's like a football analogy. We say to spend time with God. Let God's voice be the first voice that you hear. Before anyone gets up, spend time with God. And one of the ways we do that is through this thing called the Bible app. And so what we do as a church is we're reading through the Bible in a year. It's hard. We're trying to read through the Bible in a year. And so I would just encourage you, hey, every morning, maybe one morning this week, Wake up and jump on the Bible app. Join us as we read through the Bible in a year. And let God's voice be the first voice you hear in your day. And see how that changes things. In Romans, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. But I so believe that faith comes by hearing the word of God. But really by hearing ourselves declare the word of God. Like, it's one thing if you just come on Sunday mornings and you hear me talk about the Bible. It's another thing when you get home and you open this up and you start reading. Wow. Jesus provided for 5,000 people when there was nothing to provide them with. He multiplied those things. Wow. Wow. Jesus has a story about how he would leave 99 sheep to just go find one. Wow, he must really love me. Like you get in here and you read it. And honestly, the Bible in the year is the best way to do it because otherwise you end up doing this. I don't know, maybe you've done it before because the Bible is intimidating. Like this is a big book. And where do I start? Maybe you've done this um, where you do this. God, speak to me today. Speak to me today. God, if you're real. You will speak to me. God, I will never listen to Drake again if you would speak to me today through this verse. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. Amen. (laughs) You ever done that before? (laughs) Just jump in the Bible app. They have it set up for you. Just read what it says to read. Or maybe that's too much. Just start reading the verse of the day. I think that's a great place to start. And start remembering those verses so that when you get those thoughts, when the devil would come and attack you in your thoughts, that you have something to fight back with. (laughs) God, I I think he could work through that maybe. Maybe. Uh, the Bible was, says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. We went, to, um, we went to Santa Cruz a few months ago, my family, me and my wife, our two oldest, Micah and Hendrix, and uh, my wife was still pregnant with our third. And we're at Santa Cruz, um, which is, I grew up in Hawaii, so any beach for me, like, Santa Cruz is kind of a beach. Um, and so we went to Santa Cruz, and we're playing, and we're having fun. My kids love the sand. They jump in the water, jump back out, roll around in the sand, get up. They're a mummy. Like, it was incredible. We had such a fun time. And um, I always kill the fun early. And so I said, hey, boys, and they already know what that means. I said, let's pack up. Let's go. Like, I'm tired. And so we're getting ready to pack up and we're putting things away. We had this really cool umbrella that we just bought that you stick in the sand and it just stays upright and doesn't move. And so I'm packing that umbrella up and uh, I look up for a second and I say, okay, there's Micah. He's five. Uh, Okay, there's my wife. Where's Hendrix? Hendrix is our two-year-old. Man. This is weird. Where's Hendrix? 
And so my first thought is, I need to look at the water, right? Because, like, he can't swim. Like, he's, my son is, like, this tall. Like, he definitely can't get over the water. And so I'm looking at the coast. I'm looking for his watermelon swim shorts. And I'm looking around, and I can't find him. I say, okay, well, that's good. Like, he's not in the water. That's good. And then my wife watches all these crazy shows like 2020, Dateline, and 48 Hours, and I watch Criminal Minds. And so we're thinking like the worst possible thing could happen. And so I look back to the boardwalk because I'm thinking if someone snatched him, I'll be able to spot him running towards the boardwalk. And so I look, staircase, 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 no watermelon swim shorts. So I'm thinking, man, water, he's not in there. He's not at the boardwalk. Where the heck is my son? And so we're running down. My wife is yelling at the lifeguard, hey, hey, we can't find our son. And I'm running down the beach, and I'm just running up to random people. And I'm like, hey, have you seen this little boy? He's like this tall. He's wearing watermelon swim shorts. No, okay. Have you seen this guy? He's like this tall, watermelon. No, no watermelon swim shorts. Have you seen, have you seen this guy? He's like this tall. You can't miss him. Watermelon swim shorts. Have you seen him? I'm going all the way down the beach, and nobody had seen him. And so I turn back, and I start walking back. And to my surprise, there's Hendrix walking with this lady, smiling as we're crying. I say, Hendrix, what happened, dude? Bird. I said, what? What'd you say? Bird. He was chasing this stupid bird <laughs> and ended up a quarter mile down the beach just chasing this bird. Like, dude, come on, man. But in that moment, you have to understand, like, there were some thoughts in my head. And I feel like the devil used that and tried to take advantage of that moment because I heard questions like, dude, are you going to be a good dad? And then I heard accusations like, man, you're a terrible father. You lost your kid? What's wrong with you? And then I heard these other things like, man, you go up on stage on Sundays and you lead people in worship, but you can't even keep track of your kids? A lot of times what happens in those moments is we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We need to hear ourselves declaring God's goodness and what God's promised over our lives. And so in that moment, I had to stop and say, I am a good dad. I'm gonna be a great father. Like God knew that I was gonna have kids before I even knew. God entrusted me with these kids. I'm gonna care for them, I'm gonna be great. No, just because that happened, that doesn't determine how life is gonna be moving forward. And I heard the voice of the devil say, hey, Austin, come on, man. Historically, look at your family. All the guys, come on, you're not going to be a good dad. You're not going to be a good husband. It's just not in your family. It's just not what you're meant to be. But I had to go back to what God said. I had to remember the promises that he had over our lives. Psalm 92, the promise that God gave to Mercy and I, those who are rooted and planted in the house will flourish in the courts of our Lord. I said, no, 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 no. This happened, but this doesn't determine who I am as a husband or as a dad. God has greater things in store for me. Hold on, hold on. Yes, he was chasing the bird. But that means nothing about Mercy and I as parents. We're going to be great parents. God's positioned us in a church with great people around us. And we're going to do life well with our kids. And even to this day, if I'm to be honest with you, there's times where I have thoughts like that. Or I feel like the devil will take advantage of that time. Hey, hey, Austin, remember? Remember when you lost your son? Hey, hey, Austin, remember that? Man, you must not care about him. And the moment that happens, I have to fight back. I say, hold on, man. That's not what God says about me. And I would encourage you today, during this week and during this message series, to find verses in the Bible that you can use when those thoughts come into your mind. When those thoughts come into your mind, what are you saying? Like, are you, 
Are you going along with those thoughts? Oh my God, I'm terrible. I'm never going to be a good dad. What am I doing here? Or are you fighting back and saying, well, that's not what God said about me. And if God didn't say it, then I don't believe it. See, the lie that Martha believed is that God's love is based on what I do and not on what he's done. Martha thought that her mistakes or her potential to make mistakes would keep her from God. Martha thought that, not, that sitting at the feet of Jesus was a mistake. Like, I've got to be doing stuff. But we read in the Bible where Romans, it says, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither height nor depth. I think of that song. Uh, oh, my gosh, now I can't think of it. Ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from you. That's like God. God's saying that. Like there's not a mistake that you can make that would separate you from his love. Nothing in this world can keep us from God loving us. And the third thing we can learn about Martha is Martha was discouraged by the voice of me or her. You read in the Bible where it says that Martha was pulled away by all she had to do. In one translation, she says, Lord, don't you think it's unfair? Don't you care? Have you ever felt that way in your life? Going through something difficult. You're like, God, do you even see me? Like, where are you? In the midst of four billion people on this globe, like, it feels like you overlooked me. Like, don't you care what's happening in my life? Do you see what's happening? Do you even care? I remember a few years ago, I was flying back from Las Vegas on um, Southwest Airlines because it's cheap. And uh, I was sitting in that seat eating just a delicious bag of peanuts because that's what they give you. Drinking a cup of 7-Up with like 12 ice cubes in it, because that's also how they pour your drink. It's so annoying. It's like a cup with ice cubes and a splash of 7-Up. And I remember sitting there on that plane. I was coming back. Um, My wife and I were in Las Vegas a few years ago uh, when my mom had passed away. She was walking across the street and this guy in his work truck wasn't looking and ended up hitting her. And so we sat in that hospital room uh, for about two days just praying. My God, make it happen. God, heal her. God, you can do it. God, I remember when you said Talitha Kum to the little girl. And Talitha Kum means little girl, get up and walk. And so I remember praying that prayer. Talitha Kum, Talitha Kum, Talitha Kum. Like if Jesus said it, I should say it. It's going to happen. And so we're flying back from Las Vegas because nothing had changed. She had actually passed away. I remember thinking these thoughts, just like Martha would think, God, don't you care? Don't you care about what I'm doing? About like what I've done? Like every Sunday, God, I've lead people in worship and this happens to my family? Like God, I'm a good person. What the heck? I God, I lead community groups, and I serve on the kids' church team, and I wave at people, and I give them message notes when they come in. God, did you see when they, when they passed the bucket and they talked about that generosity challenge? Like, I put something in there. Why? Why did this happen to me? Like, God, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Why did this happen to me? And I felt like in that moment on that plane, which is like the closest time, the closest I ever am to God because I'm deathly afraid of airplanes, and so I'm always praying. Like, you want to talk about pray without ceasing? I am in that chair, boy, gripping that armrest. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. That's my prayer on the airplane. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I remember sitting there. And it was just after the turbulence had kind of settled, because when you leave Las Vegas, you have to go over this mountain range, and that's kind of where it gets rocky. That's where I'm praying the most. And so 
the flight had settled, and I felt like God said this, Austin, I see you. Like, I see you. And I thought of the verse in Psalm 8, where it says, when I consider the heavens and the earth and all that you've created, who am I that you would even care? And I felt so comforted that God would come to me at a moment where I created space for him to say, Austin, like, I see you. That didn't change what happened, but it changed my perspective. Because the reality is, like, life happens to all of us. And it wasn't like God was pinpointing, hey, that guy right there, yeah, that can happen to him. Like, life just kind of happens to all of us. And Martha was in this place where she took it so personally. She's like, God, I'm doing all of this stuff for you, when in reality she was doing all of this stuff for her. Like, we need to find moments in our life where we can create space, where the space is literally for God, not what I can get from him, not how he can make me feel, but where it's literally just for God. Because we're distracted by so many competing voices. I want to do something this morning. Um, I'm going to need some volunteers. You're not going to be volunteers. Sorry, you're going to be voluntold. Um, so let's just make this quick. Joni, would you help me? Yes. See that? Joni, uh, Ryan, or do you have a baby with you, Ryan? Okay, great. Can you help me? Um, now let's have Melissa. Can you help me? I want to do this illustration really quick. Um, so let's do this. Okay, Joni, would you stand here? So Joni's going to represent Martha. Okay. Sorry, Ryan. Melissa's going to represent culture, the voice of culture. Martha, the voice of, sorry, it doesn't mean you really are. You're going to represent the voice of the devil. Okay. <laughs> He's a great guy, okay? <laughs> so you're going to stand right next to her. You can face her ear. Yep, both of you face her ear. So what I'm going to have them do is when I say three, Ryan and Melissa, you're going to tell Joni everything you did this week. Everything. Literally, like, everything. If you sneezed, tell her. Mar uh, <laughs> I said Martha. <laughs> Joni. You're going to tell us everything you did this week. Everything, okay? I'm going to be back here, and I'm going to be reading verses from the Bible to you, Joni. Joni, your goal is to be able to remember all of the, voices, all of the verses that I say, okay? Here we go. Are you guys set? You guys understand? And, like, really loud, like... It's almost like you're competing. You want her to remember what you say. You want her to remember what you say. All right, here we go. One, two, three, go. Monday, uh, louder, louder, louder. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Matthew says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will fall into place. Three, two, one, and stop. All right, Joni. <laughs> Hold on. I need you to say that one more time. What verses did I read to you? I have no idea. <laughs> this is our life. We have so many competing voices. Culture, the devil, God. But Joni didn't hear a word I said as I was trying to affirm her through scripture. And isn't that the same thing at times with our lives? You guys can go ahead and sit. We have so many voices that are competing for our attention. But it's just a matter of creating space so that we can hear from God. 